Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Encounter, uh, I want to welcome everybody, uh, both those here at the Metropolitan Pavilion and those that are watching us online. My name is Stephen Lewis. I'm a professor of English at the Franciscan University of Steubenville, and I will be the moderator for this event. Um, I'm going to give a shortened bio. The longer bios of the uh, speakers are available on the, in the program. Andrea Moro is professor of general linguistics at the School of Advanced Studies in Pavia, Italy. He obtained a PhD in linguistics at the University of Padua. He has been a visiting scientist several times at MIT, first with a Fulbright, Fulbright grant and then at Harvard. He studies the structure of human languages and its relationship with the brain. He is the author of several books published by MIT Press, including Impossible Languages, 2016, and, um, and The Secrets of Words, uh, which he wrote with Noam Chomsky in 2022, and most recently a novel, The Secret of Pietramala. Pietramala. Marguerite Peters, is the director of Dialogue Dynamics, a Brussels-based institute studying the key concepts and operational mechanisms of globalization with a view to promoting an intercultural dialogue on such issues. Marguerite holds a PhD in political science from the Wisniewski University in Warsaw, Poland. And her books translated into a number of languages include the globalization of the Western cultural revolution. So let's thank our, uh, welcome our speakers, and Andrea will begin. Okay, so let me. Start the time, okay. Um, thank you for the presentation, and thank you all for being here this warm morning. Um, let me start with a, a kind of a methodological principle that I would like you to have in the back of your mind throughout this presentation, which is the idea that sometimes to explain what is possible, one must first capture what is impossible. And now before um, starting, I organized this talk in four steps, and I hope to be able to get you through this trip between grammar and brain. And you are, if you come out of this room with more answers than questions, I failed. <laughs> if you have more questions, then I would be very happy. First thing is to show how good I am with PowerPoint. <laughs> I, it, I will do that for four times, so believe me. And, uh, but <laughs> um, let me start with the idea of information, which incidentally has a very extremely interesting etymology. Well, information in, in, in first approximation can be considered to be the trace of the world on an individual. All animals receive units of information and selectively store them into their brain. What you see there actually is a stone and a frog's brain. In a sense, a frog's brain and a stone are quite similar modulo the level of complexity of, and elaboration of information. And then humans come. Um, humans also store experience in their brains as a finite set of words, but it can also generate new and potentially infinite representation by recombining the very same words in different order. And this is what is called syntax. Let me give you a micro-language made only in three words, a verb, a name, and another name. A human brain with these three words can construct two completely different scenarios. Cain killed Abel, Abel killed Cain. Same bricks, different structure, different meaning. This is what is called syntax. Interestingly enough, syntax is independent of meaning. Why is it so? Because it's not actually, it's kind of counterintuitive. Well, we can say this triangle is blue, and that makes sense. We can think of a blue triangle. But actually, we can actually say this triangle is a circle, which is impossible to figure out, even if you think a lot. Some of my students come up at the end of the class saying, well, prof, I figure out a, a circle triangle, but <laughs> believe me, it's, it should be impossible. But actually, what is also impossible, uh, strange enough, is that you can create words and create fake 
um, vocab vocabularies and say something like, the Gulf gunf the brawls, which I hope doesn't mean anything in New Yorkese. <laughs> but this is actually something that humans have always done. If you, the Voynich manuscript at a Yale, we had invented plants, which is a wonderful um, piece of art, uh, you, would, you would know that in all literature, French literature, all literature, and in fact in children's play, everyone invents words from the Jabberwocky up to Italian uh, Fosco Maraini. And then you do really see what is impossible. This is a real impossible sequence of words. Is the blue triangle this? It would make sense because of the meaning, because we know that the triangle is blue, it makes sense. But that is an impossible construction. But then comes the real striking fact. As I told you, a frog, and a stone can incorporate information from the outside. So suppose we are seeing the following scene. A girl saw a rose-shaped cloud over the hill. And then you perhaps experience another phenomenon and say, a boy heard a dog barking in a dark forest. And then here we come. We take these two sentences that correspond to an experience and we come up saying, a dog saw a dark rose barking over the cloud. <laughs> this is humans. By recombining words, we can make, uh, this, we can describe things that never happen. And this is the crucial fact implied by syntax, is that we can generate meanings which do not correspond to any experience, which is sometimes called a creative use of syntax, or in short, fantasy. In other words, would, would deserve uh, meaning. Uh, let me, I will very, go very quickly through one other important fact. Syntax is the boundary between all animals and us. This was recognized by Descartes. There exists no person who cannot put together words and by this compose a discourse to express his thoughts. On the contrary, there is no other animal so perfect or posed in such a favorable condition to perform the same task, discourse and methods. 400 years after, um, Stephen Anderson, I have many gla glasses, but I, I forget to use them, so. <laughs> <laughs> As if I were looking to a point. <laughs> 400 years ago, the president of the American Linguistic Society said precisely, no, I mean, aware of that, precisely the same thing. The communication system of all other known animals, again, all other animals, are based on limited, fixed set of discrete messages, and one that cannot be expanded by combining elements to form new and different complex messages. Now, the question could be, are we sure? Are we sure that there is no animal can, that can do that? Well, actually, here in New York in the 70s, a wonderful experiment was carried out by um, Thomas Bever, now at the University of Arizona in Tucson, with a no, colleague of Noam Chomsky, and Anne Laura Petito, a Canadian woman, and they taught um, sign language to a chimp. You know, chimps have not less than 98% of genome. And it was very interesting. This is the paper which came out in Science. And this is a picture of, of uh, Laura with Nim Chimpsky. That was the name of the chimp. And the chimp was able to learn a word, 128 different words. But when it came to combining words to get meaning, none of 19,000 sentences or sequences was meaningful. So chimps have dictionaries, but they don't have syntax. And now, taking this for granted, taking it, the fact that our brain is unique in that we can compose meaning by recombining the same bricks, we can go to something that was completely unexpected. Uh, there was a surviving myth in the 50s, up until the 50s. It can be summarized by the following uh, quotation. Languages can differ from each other without limits and in unpredictable ways, Martin Jews, 1957. And then things have been completely um, revolution by applying to syntax the same thing that was applied to all other domains of science, like physics. Um, the idea was that, um, 
you can, basically you can take a complex thing and reduce it to simple elements and simple operations. This is called deconstruction. The construction of syntactic complexities into simple units and operations started in the 50s at MIT by Noam Chomsky, who proved that there are limits to variation in all languages, provided by the same core set of principles. Other extremely important work was done by Joseph Greenberg, who compared different languages and, and resulted. Now, this is a delicate slide, because I want to convince you, I want to give you at least an image of what the decomposition mean. And I found an object, a piece of art, that to me, when I saw it, I was with a group of friends, and they, they all loved it. Was, I, was, um, I was in New York, like I was 20 years old. It was at a Metropolitan Museum. I'll show you the, the piece of art. The first thing you will see is a chaos. But by the end of the image, you will see what it means. It's a sculpture by Man Ray, who built it in 1920. Look. Uh, it's called obstruction. It's uh, 63 coat hangers projecting a chaotic shadow over a surface. The shadow is completely chaotic. The shadow is human grammars. If we take Japanese, the language they speak in Bergamo, which is, of course is an impossible language, <laughs> people from Bergamo here <laughs> may know. Um, and all languages look chaotic. And in fact, as adults, when we want to learn a different language, we find ourselves in a, you know, in a jungle, in a forest of rules. But actually, everything seen from that point of view is simple. And the, the, the path that the linguists have to take is to go up and see the simple object and the simple rules. Sometimes I use the expression of the other side of a tapestry. You know, if, if you look at the tapestry from the one side, you see all the dots, and, but it, but if you do something you shouldn't do in museums, you go and see on the other side, you see that perhaps two red dots are the same wire that goes back and then and, and hides, and, and that grammar is this. Now, I don't, you know, I really like history of science and other sciences, and I hate when speakers only make allusions. So I want to give you one simple but core example um, that can give you an idea of how things work. And I have chosen the following one. Let's take from the dictionary a proper noun, a proper name, Tim. And think of it as a box, where boxes come in different size, right? And you can put a box within another box. Then I go back to the dictionary, and I take another word, like uncles, and I can say the uncles of Tim, a box in a box. And then I can do that another time, and I could say, the friends of the uncles of Tim. Well, in all and only natural languages, words are grouped as if they were nested in potentially infinite boxes. This is technically called syntactic recursion. There is a symbol that I used to use a few years ago. Um, I want to still use it, and you will understand why I'm saying that with caution because I still hope that, uh, like Sting said, the Russian loves their children too. This is the image that was very nice as, a, as, a, you know, as, a, as an example of recursion, the Russian dolls. Well, now we are ready to give a recipe for an impossible languages, language or an impossible rule. Let's take a very, very simple rule that happens to be real in English, in many Indo-European languages. It's not um, exemplified in Asian languages, but we could make another example that works in other languages, in the Asian languages too. So the simple rule to have in mind is the subject predicate agreement in clause structure. It's very simple. Take again the dictionary and you extract a word like marry and a verb like run. You put them together, they react, and they form a clause. The symptom that the clause work is agreement. So you say, Mary runs. That's the way our brain works. Now, um, and we have the, the singular is inherited by the noun that precedes the verb. Now, instead of taking Mary, let's take a larger box, 
with the friends of Mary and take run. Obviously, the only possible sentence is the friends of Mary run. That is, Mary becomes invisible to the verb. The only thing we can have is agreement of run with the plural friends. This is, is, this is done by instinct. We don't have to reason by that. You know, sometimes when we teach our children to speak, we recognize errors. In Italian, for those who speak Italian, we would say, vendere, venduto, piangere, piangiuto. Because by analogy, and, and they say, paint, painted, go, go it. It's obviously the case, but you don't say that, right? But these are cases where you can detect it. There is no, apart some probably linguist parents who warn their kids not to agree the verb with the inner box before going to school, because that comes by instinct. And now the generalization, which is very interesting, is that syntactic rules are based on nesting, not on the linear order of words. Well, the discovery of uh, the late of, this, of the second half of the 20th century was that more generally, comparative syntax proved that with no exception, rules never follow linear order. Flat rules, this is the reason why I put flatland the book, are impossible rules, which is per se extremely surprising because linear order is a, the only physical requirement a language has, so the children ignore a portion of um, of reality to overimpose grammar over the stimulus. And that will give us an immense amount of, of, of discussion. But now let's turn to the third part, which is the kind of a core part of today's communication. I have also a kind of appendix on machines that I discussed with, with Chomsky in the book and a lot of time but let's first go through the following one. There is an immediate question that can be posed um, um, when we face those kind of rules. That is, again, look how good I am. What are the boundaries of Babel generated by? Where do they come from? Actually, we have two options, which are exactly the same option that Plato had it could be nature or nurture. It's something that accompany Western civilization ever since the first reflections of a language. Um, I do agree that modern, I mean, Western civilization is footnotes on the margin of Plato's dialogues. But we have made some progress, especially because of empirical measure. But I want to read you. Um, um, a, a, a sentence from an, an, a wonderful book, um, The Biological Foundations of Language by Eric Lenneberg. Lenneberg was a neuropsychologist at the Massachusetts General Hospital who discovered that when a patient had a, aphasia due to a brain tumor or any kind of affection, if the patient, uh, if that happened before puberty, the recovery was 90% possible. After puberty was not. And then he said, well, puberty is not a cultural effect, right? It's a hormonal, it's a, it's a biological programming. So it can't be the case that this is all cultural. And look in the introduction what he said. He says something which is extremely important because sometimes ideology is what prevents science to make uh, the necessary steps. Here is the, the thing. A biological investigation into language must seem paradoxical as it is so widely assumed that languages consist of arbitrary cultural convention. Like in languages, two of the arbitrary sets of rules encountered in the parlor games and sports. Now, it come, my, when I say my, it's not Andrea Moro. It's always a group of people. I'm part of a team. I never do anything alone. I'm enabled. Science is always um, a, a team. And this team is with neurologists, with neurosurgeons, with a neuropsychologist, mathematician. But there is, I am a bifurcation here. I could actually close the door, take you inside here for two weeks and explain you how you know, the structure is made, where well, we got bored, and, and, and then we want to listen to what you all saying. And then the other thing is to to create one case which, if it is true, 
make the hypothesis true itself. And it is the following. If languages are limited by our neurobiological architecture instead of culture, rather than by cultural convention artifacts, then there must be such things as impossible languages, namely coherent, even simpler structures, which are not recognized as languages by our brain. It's like eating. Uh, 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 humans can eat very different things, only vegetables, only meat, insects. I live in, in Pavia, northern Italy. We eat mosquitoes, which were invented in Pavia in the 17th centuries. And, but we never drink uh, gasoline. It's not a cultural thing. Is we're not designed to drink gasoline. So I want to show you that we could construe a gasoline grammar, something that our brain was unable to digest. And the experiment was done twice. For those in the room who are acquainted with neuroscience know that how fragile the experiment in neuroscience are, very fragile. Sometimes they cannot even be repeated by the same group. So before discussing that and talking it in public, I wanted to do with two different teams. One in Germany, the Hamburg and Jena, with Maria Cristina Musso um, helping with the, with the setting, and the other in Zurich um, with uh, Marco Tettamanti. First, a group of monolingual German speakers was taught a micro-Italian and micro-Japanese, including possible and impossible rule. And now you know what an impossible rule is, one that does not respect boxes. Second, a group of Italian speakers, that's a Swiss experiment, was exposed to an invented lexical language, including both possible and impossible rules with no explicit instructions. Um, and then here's the core uh, slide. We used um, fMRI. fMRI is a machine. Machines are not intelligent, are not smart, they're machines, like scissors, like microscopes but it can be very useful. In that case, they can highlight the network in the brain that is elicited, that is involved in doing a certain task. And we explore the activation of Broca's area, something that in all right-handed people in, and 70% of left-handed people is activated while doing linguistic tasks with uh, syntax. What did we measure is the following. On the one hand, we measure accuracy. The subject had a series of sentences, and I had to say whether the rule was applied correctly or incorrectly. And then we measure the amount of blood in Broca's area to see if they two faced. First result, with possible rules, that was as expected. The, the, you know, the more was the accuracy, the more was the blood. So it means that the brain recognized them. But with impossible rules, something happened which was exactly what everyone expects and hopes for in an experiment namely the opposite. The more they could manage with impossible rules, the less that the canonical structure was activated. The activation of Broca's area augmented when the accuracy of possible rules increased, whereas it diminished when the accuracy, when the accuracy of impossible rules increased. There was no um, instruction at all. I will skip perhaps discussing it in the discussion section, the reason why we have these limits. In general, in a nutshell, the idea is that these limits help children, when we were children, to learn a language. Because if there are impossible languages, you can exclude all you know, infinite computation between words. But then, let me go to the fourth path. Descartes was interested in the distinction between humans and, and animals. And now there is a third um, a third protagonist in the scenario, which is machines. I want to show you a colossal déjà vu, which actually links this first encounter to many extremely interesting topics that will, discuss, that will be discussed here today. Let me read something that was written 20 years later in the 70s, describing what was happening at MIT in the 50s. Uh, this description is by Joshua Barachilel, a, a great uh, philosopher and logician. There was an ubiquitous and overwhelming feeling around the laboratory at MIT that with the new insights of cybernetics and the newly developed techniques of information theory, the final breakthrough toward a full understanding of the complexity of communication, the animal and the machine, had been achieved. Now, substitute cybernetic with AI. We are at the same level, exactly the same point. We are we have thrown out humans from the scenario. 
animal and machines. Where are we? Again, several paths depart from here, but I want to show you one single thing, namely a test, an experiment that we run and we publish on Cortex with Matteo Greco and Stefano Kappa by showing you an extremely interesting fact that uh, perhaps never occurred uh, to you consciously. Take a simple sentence in English like, you think I must judge a nurse before meeting the doctor. And I ask you, and I want to teach you how to make an interrogative sentence. And I can say, well, make an interrogative sentence on nurse and say, which nurse do you think I must judge before meeting a doctor? Which is a perfectly English uh, sentence. And now I ask you, which doctor do you think I must judge a nurse before meeting? I say, what? I mean, I can sort of figure out what you're asking, but, but that's not the way you do that. Uh, then grammaticality of the third sentence doesn't follow for many reasons. There is a purely geometrical explanation based on hierarchical structure, which holds in all languages. And now the point. I went to ChatGPT and I asked, which nurse do you think I should evaluate before meeting the doctor? And ChatGPT it was kind of offended and told me, <laughs> if you're looking to evaluate a nurse before meeting the doctor, you may want to consider consulting with the nurse direct supervisor and blah, blah, blah. So it means he responded, but then I did the other thing. Of course, I went to ChatGPT and said, ha ha, now, now wait for me, I asked it. Which doctor do you think I should evaluate the nurse before we're meeting? And it answered, you are looking to evaluate the nurse clinical knowledge and blah, blah, blah. Simply, ChatGPT responded to the question formulated with impossible rule, showing that it had no limit, no limit at all. So there is a, a kind of a general conclusion we can make of it, linking the, the discoveries in linguistics with impossible languages and the questions concerning our difference with machines. Machines were thought to be too weak to compete with humans. It turned out that they are too powerful to be compared to us. We evolved with limits which may not be rational. Nevertheless, the limits are allowed us to evolve the rational mind and attempt to capture aspect of reality. And one minute later. Um, there is something that I learned many years ago at the mini, Rimini meeting when uh, Owen Gingrich was invited to give a wonderful talk about Galileo. If we think of objects falling, we are instinctively uh, led to think that heavier object falls faster. There's no way. I mean, we are designed for that. But it's wrong. Uh, Galileo showed that, in fact, it's the other way around. But nevertheless, we have evolved the rational mind with the wrong limits, and we don't know why. Because, in fact, we are our limits. Let me just give you the final slide. There is one experiment which is missing here, and I should owe you, but luckily enough, I will not be able to, uh, to offer it to you. First of all, if, since we're close to Christmas, even on the, young, on the wrong side of the time arrow, if you want to make any gift, this is what I said, this is the book with Noam. But there is a third, there is a second person that influenced me a lot, although in much less uh, direct, um, uh, you know, um, uh, friendship, it was Umberto Eco. And he once mimicking Wittgenstein motto, he said, um, whereof one cannot theorize, thereof one must narrate. And this is why, since I could not teach a group of children an impossible language, I wrote a novel where people do this thing. And strange enough, they wrote it in the Upper West Side here in New York. And the book is The Secret of Pedro Mala. Let me thank you for your attention here. Grazie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear from uh, Marguerite Peters. Good morning. It doesn't seem to. Uh, yeah. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Tearing open the sleeping soul. What a wonderful theme for this encounter. Language has the power either to awaken us as human persons, it then fulfills its universal function or to manipulate us and enslave us 
it is then at the service of ideological agendas, even of totalitarian regimes, as we have seen it in communist times. As I speak here now, you and I are engaging our reason, our conscience, our heart. We are awake as free, responsible persons. Are you awake? But are you awake as free persons, as human persons? No answer. Oh. <laughs> I commit to transmit to you what I hold to be true. And you are discerning whether what I'm saying is real, helpful, conducive to happiness. Human language creates a bond of trust between human persons. In natural languages, there is a nexus between the word reality and truth. And as Andrea Moho just told us, there is a nexus between language and human identity. I would say also there is a nexus between speech and love at least love for the content that I am communicating out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, but also, hopefully, love for the truth and love for the person that I am speaking or listening to. I am not a chatbot, you are not automats, we are not data or fodder for algorithms. Some claim that we have entered a post-truth society, a society in which our emotions and individual choices matter more than reality, in which people are in practice no longer interested in the truth, in which my truth is not your truth, in which virtual reality is on a par with actual reality, in which social networks spread fake news. When the fundamental nexus between language and truth no longer exists, language can be manipulated at will. It then stops being an instrument of communication between people and becomes one of social division and chaos. The Latin word communicatio means to make common. The post-truth society is divisive. It turns reality into a text to be interpreted, a process of change deprived of fixed and substantial content. How did we come to this? If you read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you see that it does nothing more than declare what all women and men endowed with reason and conscience can universally recognize as true and good as belonging to our irreducible human nature. The language of the Declaration names reality as it is. It uses terms such as human person, inherent dignity, inalienable rights, spouse, motherhood, human personality, freedom of conscience, worship, authority of government, nations, the family based on marriage between a man and a woman, and recognized to be the natural and fundamental group unit of society. Since 1948, this universal language has either been reinterpreted or cancelled, sidelined, substituted by a novel language. There has been a quiet semantic revolution. Linguistics, the scientific study of language, has historically played a critical role in the advent of the, of the post-truth era. 
Without entering into an analysis of the history of linguistics since the late 19th century, it is useful to our purposes to underline a trend in linguistics that has at once been foundational, dominant, and ideological. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Swiss structuralist Ferdinand de Saussure, the inventor of semiotics and the founder of linguistics, related meaning exclusively to the contrast between the abstract signs and words constituting language. He studied language in an auto-referential way. He disconnected words from the concrete reality they were supposed to signify. In the late 1940s, Arne Nys, the Norwegian philosopher who would later coin the deep ecology concept, developed a theory about semantic fluidity and vagueness. Any given utterance can be variously interpreted depending on context and circumstances he stated. In the late 1960s, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, a post-structuralist, believed deconstruction was happening pervasively in the United States in all fields of human activity, whether it be cooking, architecture, geopolitics, law, or the economy. He elaborated his deconstruction discourse whereby he disconnected concepts, words, and their substance. For him, meaning is never fixed. For Judith Butler, the famous author of Gender Trouble, discourse is all there is, there is no reality, only representation. The American philosopher Richard Rorty affirmed that truths were human constructs, that knowledge was a sole linguistic affair. So you see that in less than one century, these linguists and philosophers went from disconnecting words from reality to uh, proclaiming that truth simply does not exist. These academics broke from Aristotle's metaphysical perspective. They absolutized language. You know that absolute comes from the Latin ab solvere, to separate, to detach. They separated language from concrete reality. They at once expressed developments within Western cultures in the 20th century and influenced their course. For over two millennia, faithfulness to what is, to reality, had been a pillar of Western civilization. The post-truth society denies reason the capacity to attain the truth. We realize, dear friends, that this denial stems from a moral decision to say no to the truth. It stems from a will to liberate the human being from the constraints of reality, from the conditions of existence in which he or she was placed. No one better expressed such a rebellious will than Jean-Paul Sartre, the massively influential French philosopher who claimed that man had to free himself from what is, what he called the en soi, so that he could live for himself the pour soi. This Western flight from reality has complex origins. One of them, I believe, is how Sigmund Freud the immensely influential father of psychoanalysis depicted a negative view of reality by opposing it to pleasure. 
Freud considered reality to be repressive of our sexual drives. Equally repressive in his view were what he called the superego, authority, the father, norms, institutions, civilization, the moral conscience, God. Herbert Marcuse, an a libertarian follower of Freud, advocated in his book Eros and Civilization the advent of a non-repressive society, a society in which our sexual drives would become cultural and political values. Western culture, deducted fr from Freud's repressive view of reality, that the way to liberation would go through the cultural murder of the father, which was, as we know, a dominant theme of May 68. The rejection of authority manifested itself in all fields. In politics, to give but one example, in the 1960s, the American political scientist James Rosenau coined the governance term, which has been in vogue ever since, and suggests the idea of an informal consensual management process. In subtle ways, governance deconstructs the authority of hard government and, in fact, promotes a type of power deprived of authority. Dangerous business. The non-repressive society has indeed come about since the 1960s, and with it, the subversive instrumentalization of language for outright negation purposes. A new language emerged, expressing a deconstruction of everything that the May 68 generation, generation wanted to liberate itself from partners instead of spouses, free love instead of marital commitment, free choice instead of moral conscience, couples and individuals instead of parents, families instead of the family, nature or the earth instead of creation, individual instead of person, and so on. Now, the advocates of the gender agenda wish to free humanity even from the very categories of man and woman, father and mother, spouse, son and daughter, masculinity and femininity, complementarity between the sexes, the marriage and family institutions, our sexually differentiated body, which they claim would all be social constructs or stereotypes contrary to civic equality and liberty, and therefore, to be deconstructed by all means. The deconstruction of reality has notably taken place through the construction of a new language. An impressive, ever-expanding panoply of new terms proper to the gender revolution, terms that do not name reality, but name the free choices of individuals seeking to free themselves from reality. Cis, non-binary, non drag queen, trans, third gender, xenogender, bisexual, asexual, polyamorous, aromantic, etc. Lexicons proliferate in all areas to guide us through the maze of the new semantic systems. What is really at stake here is our universal human identity. The revolution I am describing considers it the ultimate liberty to create oneself in a Promethean fashion, as if we had not received our being from another, as if we had not been engendered by a father. This was already a Nietzschean idea. Judith Butler used the phrase performative language to describe 
how one allegedly becomes what one says and does, as if nothing would pre-exist one's word and deed. But an individual saying, let me be queer, cannot come to being out of nothingness as queer. That individual inevitably pre-exists as man or woman, his or her own word and volition. David Halprin, a queer theorist, called the queer identity an identity without an essence. Indeed, gender-neutral pronouns refer to generic individuals. But isn't the identity of a citizen emptied from who he or she is, an identity of one's own ever-changeable choosing, clearly a dead end for humanity? Post-humanity seems to be the horizon following this demolition enterprise. Already in 1943, in his book, Being and Nothingness, Jean-Paul Sartre had come to the conclusion that man was a useless passion. Evolutions in the field of art since the beginning of the 20th century illustrate the deconstruction-reconstruction process of the Western Cultural Revolution its efforts to liberate us from reality and truth. After assimilating deconstruction with creation, destroying representation, absolutizing art, that is, separating art from any objective criteria of beauty, the revolutionary process has ultimately ushered since the 1960s in the proclamation that whatever the artist declares to be art is art. Dear friends, we have now got it. The freedom to choose is the cornerstone of the post-truth edifice. Traveling from one choice to the next has been the post modern individual's way of life. Traveling expresses a decision to shun personal commitment, to play one's life. The postmodern culture celebrates perpetual change. Human dignity, <clears throat> love, liberty, equality, universal human rights, democracy, are now subjected to an open-ended diversity of interpretative choices. The right to die with dignity means the right to choose euthanasia and radically destabilizes the meaning of, di of dignity. Words are willingly no longer defined to leave room for all interpretative choices. Even a candidate to the Supreme Court could not or refused to define what a woman is. Maybe Humpty Dumpty could not, uh, I'm sorry, maybe Humpty Dumpty was an early precursor of our postmodern culture when he famously declared when I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The problem is that the coexistence of substantially contradictory interpretation, interpretations is not sustainable. There always ends up being a winner and a loser amidst the diversity of interpretations vying for semantic dominance. The new system is not as inclusive as it pretends to be. Some are seeking to hegemonically impose a single interpretation as globally normative, to use semantic fog as a power grab strategy. 
They present the post-truth agenda as consensual, as common sense, to use an expression of uh, Antonio Gramsci, as the new self-evident meant to substitute what had been proclaimed to be self-evident in the US Declaration of Independence, the law of nature open to the law written on our hearts as understood in the biblical tradition and in many respects corresponding to the concept of universality in the, in the Universal Declaration. One can only consent, also a Gramscian concept, to what is self-evident. But passively consenting to agendas forged by others has an anesthetic effect. It puts us to sleep. What we want to do here is to wake up, right? So let us wake up to who we are as human persons, human persons made for love and for the truth, as human persons endowed with reason, conscience, and heart. We are not constructed. We are not generated by algorithms. We are lovingly engendered. The starting point of the post-truth era was the cultural murder of the father. Saint John reveals to us that the word of God, through whom all things came to be, is the very son of God. By culturally killing the father, we separated ourselves from the one who engendered the word. So let us go back to the father, the source of language. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have a couple minutes, but there's one question that just seems to really stand out here. So both of these presentations are focused in different ways on limits to the arbitrary um, and on limits being uh, part of being human. Um, and yet Andrea is coming from, uh, or maybe not and yet, but Andrea is coming from a scientific point of view and uh, Marguerite from a very much a philosophical uh, point of view. So how do the two, how can the two speak to each other? Like what sort of synthesis is perhaps emerging um, in this post-truth era um, that, that Marguerite was, was identifying? You wanna go first? You go first. <laughs> um, I, there is a, just a kind of, um, General observation, I, I don't think that the boundary between science and philosophy is a true one. Mm -hmm. I mean, every single step we take when we make an experiment, even a quantitative experiment, is rooted in a precise philosophical attitude. So I actually followed, appreciate, and agreed, uh, maybe, maybe not on the saussure, but this is something we can discuss after. <laughs> but I think that... Um, you, you got it, you synthesize it right. I mean, in both, not method, but in both domains, mm -hmm. we have to realize that reality comes first and reality has limits in it. You know, there is, you, you cited Aristotle, I am, uh, I keep citing Plato, so the interphenomena, say the phenomenon, quine in, up at the, Columbia University many years ago wrote a book um, on the pursuit of truth. And on the first page, there, were, there was the sentence by Plato, Sosa and Phenomena, and then there was a commercial advertisement of someone painting walls. Um, uh, uh, service, save the service, the surface, and you save it all. Mm -hmm. Actually, this was a, you know, a joke, but in fact, one cannot deny uh, the fact that interpretation cannot change reality is the object that commands it. Mm 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, exactly. Uh, but there was a little conflict between Plato and Aristotle. Oh, no? A lot, of course. <laughs> As you. And I think Aristotle was closer to reality, wasn't he? <laughs> no, that I, that I will never... You won't I agree? Will never accept <laughs> so I don't know if we, we agree or disagree, we, but we agree and... No, we, we're just possessed. Mm -hmm. Me by Plato and you by Aristotle. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. mm. No, uh, well, yes. Uh, um, I think we need to uh, really come back to who we are and uh, to rediscover this uh, sense of reality. I think this is the, the greatest challenge for our era in the time of uh, you know, virtual reality and uh, artificial intelligence and so on, to rediscover our humanity. Um, yeah, that's, uh, the, that's, the, yes. There was something you said mm -hmm. when you talked about the fact that people substitute the term creators to yes. individual, that really... Uh, um, nature, nature, nature or the earth. Uh, instead of creator, right? right? Creation, yes. Mm -hmm. Or creation. Or yeah. That really struck me, because by insisting, by cancelling the term creator, we are actually um, wiping off the fact that certain facts in life are just consequence of willingness. And so when we ask who we are, we can't exclude that someone wanted us, mm. individually and collectively. And I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. This is a subtle but dangerous falsification of a possibility. Yes. And moreover, I think not only must we rediscover the creator, but the father. I think. You know, uh, since the 18th century, with uh, the advent of deism... Uh, meeting of the minds, I was actually um, hoping for this, so... <laughs> uh, okay, well, uh, at, uh, at 10, 1045, both Andrea and um, Marguerite will be available for book signing um, out there. And uh, Mar um, Andrea has The Secrets of Words and also uh, Impossible Languages available. And uh, Marguerite, The Globalization of the Western Cultural Revolution. So please visit them and have them sign a copy of their book. One important announcement. You are a part of the New York Encounter, a place that welcomes everybody. Help us keep it alive. We invite you to give generously at our donation table outside this auditorium or in a couple of clicks at newyorkencounter.org slash donate. Your donation is tax deductible. So please join me in thanking our speakers one last time. And, and, and thank you.